I'm a big believer in never being sore. You should train, and the next day you should wake up feeling good. Let's say there's something called rate of perceived exertion. Okay? So let's say I make you do pull-ups, and let's say the maximum amount of pull-ups you can do, the maximum amount of pull-ups is 10. Let's keep a nice round number. At 11, you couldn't do 11. If I put a point at a gun at you, you couldn't do 11. Should I make you do 10 pull-ups on our workout? No. I'm going to make you do five. Why? Because I'm setting you up to work the next day. The next day we're going to do five. And the next day we're going to do another five. And then we're going to do six. When six is really easy, we're going to do seven. Why? If you count, if, the, if you did 10 pull-ups on Monday, you're going to be sore till Thursday. Let's say it's really your max. So Thursday, you've only done 10 pull-ups. From Monday to Thursday, you've only done 10 pull-ups. Me, I've been doing five pull-ups every day. So I'm at 20 pull-ups already, 25 pull-ups. Mm. I have more volume than you. Uh. Now, if you add up at the end of the year, who trained more? I've trained way more than you. So let's say I go to jiu-jitsu practice. I'm doing jiu-jitsu every single day, three rounds, five days a week. That's 15 rounds. You go in twice a week, but you kill yourself. You do five rounds each day. You, kill, you push yourself those last two rounds and you burn yourself out. I still did 15, you're at 10. At the end of the year, I've done countless rounds. More, I mean, I've had so much more training than you. So how much training can we pack in in the week? That's the real question. How much volume can you expose your athlete to? So I always tell people, look, energy, uh, sorry, exercise can produce energy. So let's say I'm feeling like a seven out of 10. 10 being I'm really like energized. One, I was like really lethargic, feeling like I need to lay down. And seven, I'm feeling good, okay? If I get up, and I do a right amount of exercise, the right amount, I can feel like an 8.5. Exercise can give me a tonic effect, like drinking this coffee. So let's say I just do some jumping jacks, I hit the back for a couple of rounds, I'm feeling good. Once you get that high, shut it down. Don't go into the phase where your body's beat up, tight, broken up. Don't redline the body. That's only for training camps, for a, for a small period of time. Why? Because you get a little bit more from the system. But in the long run, you get less. In the long run, you've taxed the system. So if you do that regularly, by the time you actually get good, you'll be broken up. Mm. That's why I do a lot of flow training. Have you ever, have you ever heard of uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's uh, uh, flow? No. Okay, so can you, can you, Jamie, can you look up a flow chart? It'll be so much simpler. Like just put in flow, uh, flow in the workplace, or flow chart. This is such, this is pure genius. This guy is a pure genius. Basically, he went and he, uh, he coined the term flow. So like when you're in a state of flow, we've all been in a state of flow. The number one, um, uh, way to know that you're in a state of flow is time fl flies by. I'm sure sometimes you've done podcasts and you're like, "Wow, is it three hours already?" Yeah, it was. It was a great podcast. You know, the one where you have the worst guest or you're you're having the worst workout. It feels like every minute is an hour. That's yeah. a, that's a bad. You're not in a state of flow. A state of flow is you're having the right amount of difficulty, but it's not so difficult that you go into stress, and it's not so easy that you're bored. It's the right amount of challenge. So let's say it, as simple as playing like Tetris. If I put you on a if I put you on a level that's too high, you're gonna be like you're gonna play for five minutes. You're gonna be like I'm done. If I put you on a level too easy, you're gonna be like this is boring. If I put you at the right amount of level, you see that's just the flow channel. So if the challenge is too high, you'll meet anxiety. If it's too low, you're boredom. When I go in the practice room, I'm trying to create flow. I'm having fun. Uh, training should be addictive. Imagine training was addictive. Everybody would train. Everybody would be fit. But people always go into anxiety. They go and they kill, they slam their body. And then I have to convince you to do it again three days later, two days later. And you're like, dude, the mental energy is going to take me to get there. Like, it shouldn't be, it should be, training should be a pulling force. It should be pulling you. You want to go training. If you don't want to go training, it's not fun. If it's not fun, you're not going to do a lot of it. Mm. And if you're not going to do a lot of it, you're never going to reach mastery. So how do I make it pleasurable? How do I make it fun? I have to be in a flow state. And you can get into a flow state in almost anything. But when you're out of that flow state, cut it. We're going to get further. We're going to do more training if we cut it today and come back in tomorrow. Because I'm a big believer in consistency over intensity. Intensity should be done one in a, once in a while. Because by nature, intensity can only be done once in a while. If you're going hard every day, you're not really going hard every day. You can't go your max every day. There's a, there's a, there's a cost to going to your max. Can you sprint every single day? You cannot sprint every single day. It's ludicrous. You can sprint once or twice a week. The best sprinters in the world, they sprint once or twice a week. Nobody sprints every day. Because intensity, by nature, entails that you need to take a break. Because if you don't need to take a break, you didn't really go to your maximum intensity. If you lift your maximum lift, the maximum amount of reps, you can, the, the maximum weight you can lift, 
if you do two reps, that wasn't your max. Because if it was, you wouldn't have a, have a second rep in you. Mm. You understand? Right. I would have to give you a break for you to have a second rep. So we didn't find your true max, right? Intensity, maximum effort entails you have to stop because it's the maximum. There was no more reserves. There are no more reserves. So what do you think about people that, that say there's no such thing as overtraining? Here's the, the John Denner narrative, and I don't. I, 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 he see, he coins it really, really well. He says, "Look, it's under rest." So he says, "Look, you can overtrain if you didn't give your body the rest later." Yeah. But he says, "Look, no matter how hard I, I push in practice, if I didn't kill myself, I can rest from it and recover and have super com compensation." I agree with that. Some guys have made great strides with just mental fortitude and mental strength, overtraining the shit out of themselves. Okay, but can I ask you this? Yes. They were successful, yeah? Yeah, okay. but their bodies break down. Right. But could they, could, could they have been better if Possibly. they used flow? Exactly. Right. As so good as they were. Like Dan Gable, for example. Right. example. Like that, what Dan Gable essentially was done in his 20s, right? In terms of like his body's broken right. down. Exactly. Knee replacements, hip replacements, th that kind of deal. Let me ask you this. Who wins more often, Russians or American wrestlers? Russians. Every time an American wrestler wins, he's like some pro prodigy. Mm -hmm. He's rare. It's rare. It does happen, but it's rarely he's a technical master. Right. However, you have these Russian guys that win gold medals. You've never heard of them, and they're like Michael Jordans of the, of the sport. Yeah. There's just so many of them. They train long, consistent practices. Whereas in America, we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday hard. We kill it, and then you rest Tuesday, Thursday. The Eastern Bloc had a totally different understanding. They're like it's volume, volume, volume. Near the fight, short and intense only near the, the competition phase. But before that, it's the maximum amount of volume you can... Imagine me and you are, are, are we're two athletes, A and B, you're A and B. You're training jiu-jitsu three times a week really, really hard. You're going all out. I'm training jiu-jitsu every single day. My average practice is two hours, your average practice is two hours. But when you go in, you kill it. Like you, you, go, you go with all the black belts and you kill it. At the end of the year, I'm averaging three practices or two practices more than you so i've had a hundred practices more than you by the end of the year 104 practices mm. let's give two weeks for vacation 100 practices more than you 200 hours more than you have been training when we roll your intensity that you put on the mat is going to be irrelevant why because i've also tasted that intensity periodically it's not that much of a factor now when you go super aggressive on me when you attack me aggressively i have felt that i know how to deal with it plus i have an extra 100 hours on you 200 hours so I'm going to mangle you. You know what I'm saying? Mm. The volume is far more important than the intensity. The intensity by nature is need, is need to be done periodically. If you do it every day, it's not intensity. So how the Russians, how do they structure their training? They're more playful. You know, they kind of like, they kind of warm up, they kind of flow roll, they kind of like, they do a lot of technique, high emphasis on technique. Now, a lot of people hearing this are going to be like, well, the Russians also are funded by their government. You know, they, their government supports them a lot more than maybe an American uh, wrestler. Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree with that. There are many factors. However, we can't deny that they're technically, uh, I hate to say the word superior, but they're technically more advanced.